Thank you. Gloria. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Red Civil. I'm the director of New Life CDC. If you'd like a Bible to follow along with John chapter 5, raise your hand. One of the ushers can get you one. We're in John chapter 5, really rich passage that we're going to go through today. And so even if on your phone, um, go to BibleGateway.com, go to John chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 1 through 15, really rich passage. So please feel free to follow along. We're in a series about bridging barriers, becoming the people of God for our city, We've talked about taking down political walls that might separate us. We talk about taking down racial walls. Today, we focus on bridging economic barriers and how Jesus enters into the margins from John chapter 5. So please, uh, whether you're here watching online, please follow along with John chapter 5. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for breaking through barriers to reach us. And so, Father, we simply ask that you give us the grace, the desire, Lord God, the heart to be able to do the same with others in the margins. That's what I ask, Lord God. Thank you for being with us today. We lift this all up to you as part of our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Census data recently came out in September um, about where the highest concentration of poverty is in the U.S., And they actually listed the four states with the highest concentration of poverty. And according to the most recent census data, it's California, Texas, Florida, and New York. And so just out of curiosity, I wanted to look up where in the U.S. are the highest concentration of riches, of wealth. And there's actually a list of where the most number of billionaires live, according to state. And so let me list the top four. California, New York, Texas, and then Florida. So the top four states with the largest concentration of poverty also has the largest concentration of wealth. Obviously, an economic barrier exists between the have and the have-nots, even if they live in the same state. And so now, before we're quick to blame the rich for putting up the walls or the poor for putting up the walls, you know, let's just look at ourselves for a second. Let me look at myself. I know it's really simple and easy for me to be able to either erect or maintain an economic barrier between me and those on the margins. Have you... I know I've done this. Have you ever avoided someone maybe on a subway train that either smelled different, looked different, sounded different, you switched subway cars? Have you ever done that? Or have you ever just kind of withheld a handshake or a hug from somebody simply because of what they look like, how they smelled, how different they are? I know, I know I've done that. And so it's so easy for me, and maybe for you as well, to either erect or maintain those barriers between us and those in the margins. And so that word margins, I'm going to use that a few times, and so I just want to describe it a little bit. Just like on a piece of paper, the margins, the part of the paper that's in the edges. And so in our culture, there are metaphorical margins as well. And in these margins live a lot of people in great need. And many of them, though in great need, are largely invisible. And we can walk past them. I saw this picture that just demonstrates this reality. I mean, if I look at that picture, I I can easily draw two red lines to the left and right of that person. And in, in the margins, there are also bedrooms that may look like this. And yet, what we've been talking about the past few weeks is how the cross of Christ isn't just a bridge that gets us to God, it's a sledgehammer that breaks down walls that separate us from the poor or the marginalized. In other words, what this statement is saying, we are all meant to live barrier-free. Why? Because Jesus pulls down walls. Jesus pulls down barriers. And when we we live a life that's barrier-free, we experience more of who Jesus is. 
And when we go through John chapter 5, we'll see the existence of these economic walls, social economic walls, and then we'll see what Jesus does to be able to pull it down. And so just turn with me to John chapter 5, really great passage to read along. John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, the reading of God's word. It's about a man healed at the pool of Bethesda. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, pool, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Verse 3. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blame, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. If there's a multitude there, imagine the kind of pushing and shoving that one might see. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That's a long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry the bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. And then last two verses. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. When we look on this passage, we see that there are all these different kinds of walls that exist. And so when you look at this passage in verse 1, it talks about a feast. And so there's a feast in the mainstream. Meanwhile, in the margins, there's a high concentration of sick and those impoverished. And so there's a wall that separates them. And can you imagine for a second what kind of smells that you smell in the feast? I imagine there's a smell of great food. But what kind of smell might there be in the margins with people sick up to 38 years? And so there's a, there's a wall. There's a wall that exists. And then lastly, what is the sick man's name? He doesn't have one. So the writer John knows exactly how many years he's sick, and yet John the writer doesn't know his name. And so he knows a, a great deal of detail about this person's sickness, but doesn't know his name. And so I know, for me, if I know, if I know more about the details of a person's disease rather than the details of a person's identity, there are barriers that exist. And that's what we find here. And it's not just, it's not just in Scripture, these walls. It's, it's also in our daily lives, even here in Elmhurst Corona, and even as we work under New Life CDC. And I just want to show you some pictures about some of the profiles of the individuals that can easily be pushed to the margins. We have the homeless men and women in our neighborhood who might sleep under the footbridge on Grand Avenue or on the on-ramp to the LIE near Woodhaven Boulevard. And if you look, you can actually see mattresses and clothing there. That picture on the bottom left is somebody who used to come here um, homeless individual that would come in with a hood on. For a couple of times, he would just sit in the back. I, I, I just took a picture of him. And then, what's sad is many of the individuals in the margins are kids. Many of these kids live with families of four or six. Many of them live in one room, shared with, Live in, living in an apartment shared with other families. Can you just imagine doing your homework in a room with six people? And so they fall behind. Little support at home, especially if the parents don't speak English. It's difficult. And the sad reality for me, I have, um, 
I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, and I know that as we continue to explore better schools and move our kids to, to better schools, I just know that these kids in the margins are going to be more and more invisible to me. Because chances are I'm going to see less and less of them as I move my kids to greater schools. That's a sad reality. And then there are people in our midst who are, are sick, that can easily be disregarded as well. That's a picture of a man with a condition on his leg. And there are men, so many young men, um, who struggle with alcohol. And then also there are those who are our newest neighbors. Uh, the immigrants, the immigrant families in our midst are trying to survive. Work isn't stable. Um, immigration or work status is difficult. They can easily be pushed to the margins as well. English can be limited. There's such a growing sentiment in our country and all across the globe just to simply keep them out. And you know, I wonder, like, why, is it, why, is it so, why is it so easy to either put up or just maintain these walls between me and those very different than me? I'll tell you why it's easy. It's so easy for me to say, I don't need them. I don't need them. I can live a, perfectly, a perfect American life without knowing any of them. Especially in the pursuit of the American dream, who's got need for the poor when the goal is economic prosperity through hard work? What do I need them for? And so it's so easy to just put up those walls. And yet, if you are a follower of Christ, it might well be that distancing yourself from the poor might well be the biggest oversight of your spiritual walk. If you are a follower of Christ, distancing yourself from those on the margins might well be the biggest oversight of your spiritual life. Why? If, if you look on Matthew 25, Jesus says, how you treat the poor is an indication. It's an indication of whether you will receive eternal punishment or eternal life. That's sobering. In verse 40 of that same passage, Jesus says, whatever you did for one, just one, one of these, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. It's so interesting that when Jesus talks about how we treat and relate to the poor, he calls the poor family, his brothers and sisters, according to that verse. Mother Teresa puts it this way, only in heaven will we see how much we owe to the poor for helping us to love God better. In other words, if you love the poor, you love God. And if you love God, you will love the poor. And so when I read through John 5, I take heart to see how Jesus did it. May we do the same. And so just when I explore that, there are three beautiful actions that Jesus does in pulling down the margins in John chapter 5. Again, I invite you to read along and follow along. Three beautiful actions of Jesus. The first is, like I mentioned earlier, there is a feast in the mainstream, and then there is sickness and poverty in the margins. Guess where Jesus is? Jesus is in the margins. And so just the first action of Christ there is that Jesus leaves the feast, and he enters into the margins. Now, Jesus knows how to feast. If you look in John chapter 2, the wedding, the wedding of Cana, he knows how to feast. But he doesn't stay in the feast. And so we may feast, but we're not called to stay in the feast. And what he does, he enters into the margins. He skips the feast and enters into the margins, into, into the world of this sick man, and in so doing, he begins to break down barriers. Listen, if, if, you, if you had a chance to be able to go to a party, a feast, great food, great festivities, or enter into a smelly subway car where the sick and the impoverished are, where would you go? I would go to the party. I would go to the feast. Jesus did that, goes to the feast, but he doesn't stay there, and he enters into the margins. May we do this? I mean, let's just uh, think about that for a second. Jesus left an environment of comfort, entertainment, festivities, and then enters into the world of a person in the margins. Am I willing to do the same? 
Are you willing to do the same? To even momentarily leave, a, leave the feast of a life of comfort, luxury, entertainment in order to follow Jesus into the margins? Would you be willing? May you sense his invitation today because when you do, barriers come down. Barriers come down. We begin to get a glimpse of a life that's barrier-free and experience a newness of who Jesus is because he's in the margins. His, the, second, the second action of Jesus, this man is like the invisible in our culture. And what, in, in verse 6, um, it reads that Jesus sees the person and begins to hear his story. He sees the person, hears his story. Sometimes I, I ask myself, when was the last time I made eye contact with a homeless individual? Eye contact with a failing student? an isolated teenager, an immigrant mom or dad? When was the last time I made eye contact with a person like that? Somebody very different than me. But that's what he did. He makes eye contact. I imagine it looks something like this. This picture is a little inaccurate because the Word of God says there was a multitude there. And so in that pool, just picture 50 more people. And that's what it's like. And he hears the story when he begins to ask, do you want to be made well? If you were sick and Jesus asked you, do you want to be made well, what would you say? Yes. But if you read through that, this sick man does not even say yes. What he says is, you know what? When the pool is stirred, I try to go, but I get shoved, I get pushed, I don't even get my blessing. In other words, when Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? He says, there's no hope for me. If I was sick for 38 years, I would probably think that I'll be sick for another 38. Wouldn't you? He feels, he doesn't feel that hope. And Jesus in this, at this stage, he's in his early 30s. Imagine meeting somebody who is sick, impoverished, isolated, marginalized, longer than you've been alive. That's the kind of story that he hears. Painful as, as, as it is, and yet he begins to break down walls. I was really inspired recently um, because somebody that um, I know entered into the life of Mara. She's actually downstairs today, you know, wearing a raincoat. Really sweet, sweet woman. And uh, this person who really inspired me entered, entered in. Um, and it was this middle school student. She's the daughter of the director of the health center. Her name is Hannah. And she actually spoke to Mara and wrote about it. And this is what she wrote. Mara was born in Queens. She has visited many states, including New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Her favorite foods are ribs and Italian food. The favorite time in her life was when her grandma sent her to a sleepaway camp in New Hampshire. They played sports. Her favorite is tennis. Her grandma meant a lot to her. Mara went to college at St. John's, majoring in management. Lastly, she has helped different charities and sick people by raising money with friends to do and to be in walkathons. And she still loves walking today. Don't you just, don't you just feel a wall coming down when you hear that story? It's like suddenly Mara comes alive. You know what Hannah is doing? Yes, she's seeing the person, she's hearing the story, but she's breaking through barriers. That's what this middle school st student is doing. I was so inspired by that. May we, may we do the same. The stories are difficult, and yet this is exactly what Jesus did because he's already in the margins. The third, uh, the third action of Jesus is even more moving for me because everything, everything changes when Jesus says, rise. Everything changes when Jesus says, get up. Let's look at this for a second. So he leaves the feast, enters the margin, barriers come down. Jesus hears the story. When he speaks, rise, healing comes. When he speaks, rise and get up, restoration comes. When he speaks it, there is reason to celebrate. And in verse 14, if you look, 
Jesus and this now healed man share this beautiful community space in the temple of God. And so Jesus moves from the feast This sick man moves from the margins, and in verse 14, they share this beautiful community space in the temple of God, possibly his first time after 38 years. When Jesus speaks, rise, there is healing that comes, there is restoration that comes. When he speaks, rise to this man, there is reason to celebrate. In other words, there is reason to feast. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus shares the feast when he speaks rise. He leaves the feast only to share it. He leaves the feast in verse 1 only to share it in verse 8. He leaves the feast in verse 1 only to enter the margins and to share the feast in verse 8. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the feast. And wherever Jesus is, there is healing. Wherever Jesus is, there is restoration. Wherever Jesus is, a person can rise out of their circumstance. Jesus Christ is your feast. Listen, when why 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 do we why do we need to break down these barriers? Why? It's because Jesus Christ did this exact thing for us. He bro- just as he broke through the barriers to get to this man, Jesus Christ bo- broke through barriers to get to you and to get to me. This sick man is a picture of you before you met Christ. This sick pe- man is a picture of me before I made a decision to follow Jesus. We were sick in our sin. We were spiritually blind, sick in our transgressions, in our iniquities. There was a barrier between us and God. And you know what Jesus Christ does? He leaves the feast of heaven. He leaves the feast of heavenly glory, and he enters into a planet of orphans. He enters into a planet of sinners. He lays down his life for you and for me. On the third day, he makes a declaration. He says, I have risen. Why does he declare this? Because he wants to say the same to you. When you follow Christ, he says to you, rise, your forgiveness has come. He says to you, rise, your restoration has come. He says to you, rise, the kingdom of God is near. Listen, you might be away from God for 38 years. You you might be sick in your sin for 38 years. An encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ changes everything because an encounter with Jesus Christ is the feast. This is your God. This is your Savior. And so when I think about this spiritual reality, if Jesus Christ did this for me, would it not be a privilege to be able to share the same with somebody else? Will it not be a privilege to simply pay it forward? And when when others lead me into the margins, I'm not an expert, other people so inspire me, but when I follow in, I don't go in as savior, I simply go in as one who wants to share what God has done in my life. And I I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is already there in the margins. And so I'm looking to experience more of who he is and more of what he has when barriers come down. Would it not be a privilege to be able to do the same as a way of our worship to our Lord Jesus Christ? And so, but, you know, what, what exactly does that mean, share the feast, speak, rise, I mean, practically speaking? I mean, what does that mean tomorrow? Do you, do you go up to a homeless individual and say, rise? <laughs> you know, what, what, what does it practically mean? Well, let me just share three things that we've learned. The first is that it means sharing what you have. It means sharing what you have. And so just going back to these pictures There's a shower facility downstairs. We simply share what we have with Mara. Our resources, food, an embrace, we share that with her. This guy is actually a mom. He used to come in with a hood on his head, sit in the back. This is a recent picture I took of him. He has served as a greeter for us, y'all. He has played baseball with us in a men's retreat. The next thing he's bugging me about now is for somebody to teach him basic guitar. Is there somebody here willing to share that with him? 
Every time I come and I see him, he bugs me about it. I said, listen, on one Sunday, I'm going to talk about you, Imam. He goes, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? He was excited. That's what it means to simply share what we have with him. Your time, your talent, your treasure. It also means entering into the space where these kids are. This is Oscar. We know him through um, Tim, which, who we introduced to you with a mentoring program, and also Barbara through Storytime. You can speak to them again in the shell room after this. We've known him since he was six. He's now in middle school. And how did we share what we have? Just new lifers mentor these kids. And so we go to a local public school and mentor kids. Here's, here's the sad reality just about mentoring. We live, we live in a day and age where it's no longer enough if you want healthy, productive, safe kids in our neighborhood, it's no longer enough to simply look out after your own. It takes a village. That's true. And one of the ways, one of the ways that you can do that is through mentoring. And so if that's, that's on your heart, speak to, speak to Tim or Delia or the scouts. Speak to them. The second thing is, the first is that, what does it mean to share the feast and speak right? It means sharing what you have, but it also means expecting the miracles of God. Listen, we're not just a social service organization. We are citizens of a miraculous king. We are citizens of a kingdom of miracles. And so you go in expecting God to move. Just like Jesus moved and he birthed miracles in John chapter 5. And so we go in expecting this, praying for this, because we're citizens of a kingdom of God of miracles. And so just... This, this gentleman, his name is Nick. He has a condition in his leg. And I'm no longer, you know what? We pray for miracles. And it used to be that I would have this fear about praying for miracles. Because if something didn't happen, God would look bad. Or I would look bad. But I don't need to defend God. God can defend himself. If God is a healer, then let him heal. And so this... This guy, he came to the pantry. He was actually the gentleman. He's right there right now, actually. So he was the one that got baptized, stayed in the water a little bit too long. We got nervous about it. Remember that baptism? So this guy actually, he passed out in the food pantry, and he was brought to the hospital, and he flatlined for more than five minutes. No heartbeat. They were going to use a defibrillator on this man, but he signed a piece of paper that said that he didn't want a defibrillator. He wanted to see Jesus already. In 10 minutes, he got up without the defibrillator. He rose from the dead. This man is a walking miracle. And you think that's miraculous? It's happened more than once. It's almost like he came to the gates of heaven, Jesus was there, and Jesus says, Nick, you're here again. I don't want you in yet. Go back down there. And so he serves at the food pantry now which is awesome. <laughs> Expect miracles. And wrestle with the tension when they don't happen. That's okay. God is in that as well. And then there are these gentlemen, you know, who struggle. The, the homeless of Elmhurst Corona, when I used to live in the city, I used to come across homeless individuals. Many of them have mental uh, disorders, um, many of them were like over 60. You know the homeless are in our community? This guy is 28 years old. They are in their late 20s and early 30s. And many of them struggle with, with alcoholism. Sometimes I go to Broadway Park. Um, you know, sometimes I meet some of them here and they're sober. Um, we, I, I, there was just one time I go to Broadway Park and I saw one of them and he was drunk. And he began to weep. He began to weep because there was so much shame in his condition. He began to weep because he was chained to alcohol. And yet the last time I heard, Jesus Christ breaks every chain. Expect miracles. There will be a day where there is such a breakthrough in addiction in this community. But it will not happen without us. 
Because God uses us. He moves through us. Expect miracles of God. And then just lastly, these another miracle, when it comes to some of these um, immigrant families, there is such instability with their work status, citizenship status. Pray for a miracle of God through that status. When people come in here and they don't have valid work status or immigration status, they feel invisible. I've felt this for more than 10 years, being an undocumented individual. You feel invisible. You, don't, you feel like you don't have a sense of belonging. You feel like you are less than. And yet, these are the peoples that Christ calls brothers and sisters. And so if we are followers of Christ, where are we to be as well? And this is actually the director of our booster club. She recently experienced, it feels like a miracle when you get this authorization. It feels like you come out of the shadows, expect miracles, even among our immigrant families. And then, so what does it mean sharing what you have, expecting miracles, And it also means something else, especially to those who are immigrants in our midst. It means entering into community. Just like in verse 14, Jesus Jesus Christ moves from the feast, this now healed man moves from the margins, they now share this beautiful community together. And you know what it means to move into the community? Or moving into community together? It means going up to somebody who can easily be pushed to the margins and saying, you add value here. You have a contribution to make here. You belong here. And we know that we're doing that well when we begin to receive from each other rather than me simply and always being the giver. And so we see that with some of these families. This is Vashti. She's sitting in this service as well. She is a head of a household, a mom, a business owner, small group leader, trainer, but she can easily be invisible. She actually leads me spiritually as a small group leader. She inspires me. And that's the beautiful thing when we enter into the commu- into community and walls come down. May we acknowledge this, that we have something to receive from those on, on the margins. Let me not spoil that. So this is Simona, um, an ESL student of ours, and she wanted to become a nurse. If you're a nurse, there's this like wicked exam that you have to go through, six hours long. It's called like the NCLEX RN exam, limited English, and that's why she came to us through ESL. She wanted to be able to take the exam, nervous about it, Uh, Let me read to you a question on this exam, okay? And many of you are dominant English speakers. See if you understand this. Question. A patient is diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. The physician prescribes ferrous sulfate. Which of the following may be a contraindication for ferrous sulfate therapy? What? (laughs) What did I just say? And that was English. She takes this test, she writes an email to Johan, one of the ESL teachers, um, and she writes this. I have extraordinary news, I passed the NCLX RN exam. I am so happy, but now I'm so relieved. Without you, I would not have had any chance. We are all so happy. That's Simona. When you... When you enter into community, it might well be that if one day, Lord forbid, this ESL teacher needs medical attention, goes to a hospital, it could may well be that it's Simona that treats him. That's such a beautiful picture of community where we're all both giving and receiving. That's a great picture of what happens when barriers come down and we enter in. And so just lastly, let me call the worship team up. Just next steps, these three really quick next steps. Meditate on John chapter 5 and get to know our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 2, he knows how to party. John chapter 5, he leaves the feast, enters in. And then also follow us at New Life CDC NYC. 
um, or facebook.com newlivecdc.us. Again, that donor said she will give a dollar for every new follower, up to 2,000 followers. Um, we have like 250 new followers. If all of you follow us, we're gonna be good. Okay, and then lastly, just um, in your bulletin, there is this map about what's happening in the shell room. Please go down, shake hands, give a hug to some of the program heads who do this kind of work. Uh, bridge barriers with us. Why don't we stand, let's pray, and then we'll respond in song, and then Rich can close their service. <laughs> Father, we thank you. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you left the feast of heaven to break through barriers to be with me and to be with us. Father, may we never forget this reality. And Father, may we do the same among the margins in our midst. We thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's respond in song. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Red. He served us. He blessed us. He taught us today. Wow, I want to invite the prayer team to come to my left. We've got the Lord's table to my right. For those of you who want to come and take bread and dip it in a cup, being reminded that Jesus Christ was the broken one who calls us to be broken and poured out for others. Listen, there are, uh, there are at least three types of people in our room, and I want to use this to invite you to come up to receive prayer. For th some of you, uh, you are on the margins. Um, you, you're economically on the margins. You're physically on the more, you're, I mean, you're sick maybe. Uh, maybe life has been really hard. And the word of the Lord to you has read, put it to us as Jesus sees you, Jesus is with you, and Jesus loves you. And maybe you just need someone to pray that into you. That you feel isolated, you feel lonely, you feel alone, you feel abandoned, you feel hopeless. Jesus sees you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And so maybe you've wrestled with isolation and loneliness, feeling like you're on the margins, poor. Uh, you can come up to receive prayer that the Holy Spirit would do something uh, in you and through you. Uh, some are on the margins. Some of you, are, you're in the feast. And you've been in the feast for a long time. I mean, you eating and eating and eating. It's like, this is, and you're like, can you give me seconds? And there comes a point where we have to leave the feast. And we have to get engaged. And God has gifted so many of you in this room and given you privileges, privileges of education and privileges of wealth and privileges of opportunity and privileges of networks and privileges of connections and all that. And at some point as followers of Jesus, we have to leave the feast. And one very practical way of doing that is to get involved in using your gifts to serve, to give and to use your time. So downstairs, there's plenty of opportunities, especially if you're not involved in any way. We talk at New Life as serving as a value to come and, and, and serve and use your gifts uh, to serve those that are on the margins. And here's the third. Some of you, you're like that man who was stuck for 38 years, and you just feel stuck. Life feels stuck. Your marriage feels stuck. I mean, you just, you just don't know where to go. And one moment, uh, one touch from Jesus, one word from God, can make anyone unstuck. It might take you years to get unstuck. In one moment, Jesus can do something powerful. This is why we close every time with prayer. Because we really believe that there is an encounter that happens when the people of God pray for each other. And if you're stuck today in any aspect of your life, maybe this past week you just said, I'm going to be here the rest of my life. Or it's going to take me forever to get out of this situation. In one moment, God can move. And this is why we close with prayer. And so as the Holy Spirit leads you, the Lord's table's to my right, uh, prayer team's to my left. We have the, uh, the CDC uh, tables downstairs. Uh, may the Holy Spirit lead us for the rest of our day. As we close, let me invite you to open up your hands towards heaven. If you're watching online, you can open up your hands as well. We close every gathering with a, with a blessing. And our hands are upward because it's a posture of receiving. And you cannot give what you have not received. And so let me speak a word of blessing over you as we close our service today. So brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit as it were leaving the feast.
to offer the feast of Jesus to those you encounter. And may you see the supernatural power of God move. May you see miracles. May you see provision. May you see the hand of God at work in your life and through your life. Knowing that Jesus Christ is alive and he is well. And so I bless you all today in the strong and the beautiful and the resurrected name of Jesus. And the people of God said, amen and amen.